Turn with me, if you would, this morning to Psalms chapter 61. Psalms chapter 61. You see, I already knew what Fred was going to say today whenever that he stood up. Because, you know, I called Fred on Friday and we had a good visit. And I wanted to just let him know that we were thinking about him, we were praying for him. And when he shared what his testimony was this morning, I'm like, Fred, you have no idea that this plays right into the message in which that God has given me for this week. Every time I turned around, even this morning in Sunday school, there was some reference that was being made that just fit right into this morning's message. Because what is this morning's message today? There's power in prayer. That's the power of prayer. And you see, that's why we need to understand and know that God hears the cries of His people. Amen. Psalm 61, verse 1 says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. And from the ends of the earth will I cry unto Thee. And when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For Thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. And I will abide in Thy tabernacle forever. And I will trust in the covenant of Thy wings, Shalom. For Thou, O God, hast heard my vows, and Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear Thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations, and he shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth, which my um, perverse per, present... Help me get that one out. Yeah. Preserve unto Thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Let us pray. Father God, we come to You this morning, God, and we just ask, God, Father, even in our weakness, that You would make us strong through the humbleness of Your Spirit as that we come, Father, before You, relying upon You and You only, God, as our source and as our strength, God. Father, we just ask this morning that this message might be a message of encouragement Father, to each and every one of us, God, here today, that we will be strengthened in our faith to make us stand for the things that are right in this life according to Your Word and Your will. For we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I love how that Psalm 61 starts out. It says, Hear my cry, O God, and attend unto my prayer. And from the ends of the earth will I cry unto Thee. And when my heart is overwhelmed, I'm going to stop right there for a moment. If you notice, Fred didn't have any problem this morning saying, you know, he was crying. He was in tears. Why was that? Because at that moment, at that time, his heart was overwhelmed. Yes. But God hears the prayers of His people and He answers. Right. Amen. I don't know if Fred left that in the back of the refrigerator months ago or not, but it was there the day that he needed it. <laughs> Amen. God answered His prayer. And that's what we need to understand is that God is still there to hear our prayers that when we are overwhelmed, He says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, that rock is Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone. And all throughout the ages, we have only had to rely upon God and God alone. Even whenever the, the children of Israel in the Old Testament were taken captive, yes, because of disobedience, yes, because of their sin and rebellion against God, but there were those that were faithful to God even through it all. I love that song, through it all, amen? And you see, because through it all, if we remain faithful to God, He is always faithful to us. Turn with me, if you would, to Daniel in chapter 6. In this morning's message, as we turn here, we find out that Daniel sought the Lord. Daniel prayed, and he prayed earnestly. But you know what I know something? Not everybody's going to like the way that you pray. Not everybody is going to like what that you have to say when it is concerning spiritual or Christian ethics and morality. Because this world has went so far off of left track that I'm telling you that immorality is running so rampant, people do not fear God the way that they should in any way, shape, or form. Years ago, people still feared God. They may have knew they were living wrong, but I tell you what, they knew what was right. But today, this generation doesn't even really understand that they are so far off track of morality 
and ethics yes. that it is a shame to where that we have came to as a nation. But in Daniel in chapter 6, I'm not going to read the whole thing, just starting into it though, and then I'm going to reiterate on some of it. Verse 1, it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over those three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, and that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. When it says the king should have no damage, he put his full trust into those individuals that were there, that he wouldn't have to worry about certain things. Whenever that you are in a place of leadership, you have to have individuals that are there underneath you making sure the old saying is, I got your back. You heard that one? I've got your back. Amen. Because you needed to know that they were there for your best interest and they weren't there to try to destroy. I have said it many a times and I'll say it again. I need people to be behind me in this congregation, not undermining me. And there are too many places in which the churches, the pastor has to fight against those type of things because you know what? Everybody's got their own mind. Everybody's got their own agenda. But we need to all be on the same track serving and following after Christ as that I follow Christ, follow me. That's really what Paul the Apostle was talking about. Follow me is that I follow Christ. And I've said it before, if I'm not following Christ, you better get as far away from me as you possibly can. But this little preacher is going to stick to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Because that's where we find these inspirational stories. That's where we find these things that happen in the real world time. And this was when Daniel was there. And that he was, we actually find out that Daniel was preferred over all of these other princes and presidents that the king there, Darius, was putting him into the place of leadership. He was number one. Daniel was number one. But now I'm just going to start to kind of tell you the story here to where that we find out that these other princes and these other individuals, they, they couldn't find any fault in Daniel. They were trying to find something that they could trip him up. They were trying to find something that was within his statute or standard and that they would be able to take him and just tear him down before King Darius and they couldn't find anything. Wouldn't that be good if we could say that of men and women today? There wasn't anything in their life that they could find to tear someone down. But they found occasion. If we find anything, it's going to be that we have to find occasion to make accusation against him in the law of his God. You see, because they knew Daniel was faithful to God. They knew Daniel was making supplications and making prayers and requests to God. So what they did was, was they went to King Darius, picking back up there in verse 5. I'll read there in verse 5. And it says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against Daniel except we find against him um, concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and um, princes uh, assembled together and the king and said thus unto King Darius, Live forever. I'm going to stop right there for a moment because even in my notes, they used flattery to be able to get to King Darius. You know, oh, oh, King Darius, live forever. You know, now they're bringing something to him as if they bring this to him. It says, and all the princes of all the kingdom and the governors and the, prin and the princes and the counselors and all the captains have a council together to establish a royal statute and to make the firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. You know, it's only going to be for 30 days, king, but you know, they, we don't want anybody asking anything else from anywhere else. And guess what? They were setting King Darius up for just the fall that he was going to have to take in this. But they would be put into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not charged uh, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Now what does that mean, which altereth not? When he made that decree, when the king Darius signed that law into ability, there was nothing that he could even do after that point to change it. So he goes ahead and he signs it at this here. But in verse 9 it says, And when king Darius signed the writing, 
and the decree. Now when, King, or when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and the window, and the, opening the window, he opened it into the chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done aforetime. This is what he had always done. This was Daniel's way of giving honor to God. Do you know when you come to church, this is another way that you are giving honor to God is that we come together to worship corporately as a unit, as one body. You're honoring God in what you're doing by being here this morning. Somebody ought to say amen to that. It would have been a lot easier on certain days just to stay home. Amen. amen. But when you make a commitment to God and you follow in that commitment to Him, God honors that. He sees that. And even though there was a decree from the government at that point that, well, they weren't supposed to make any other plea or they weren't supposed to make any other type of outreach to anyone else other than King Darius, guess what? Daniel didn't adhere to that. We as Christian believers in the world today need to make sure that we don't just fold over because of what maybe the government may tell us to do, but make sure that it lines up with the Word of God. Because you know what? All through the Scripture, somebody asked me the other day, is, is there things that are political in the Bible? And I said, <laughs> all through it. This was a political action that took place right here whenever that they set Daniel up. But you know what? Daniel stayed faithful to God. And in verse 11 it says, And these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Wow. How many of us could be found at times praying and making, making supplication before our God? Now that, at this point here, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, they brought Daniel, you know, before the king arrives. You know, and they said, now king, didn't you make a decree about this that nobody was supposed to ask anything or do anything? Well, well yeah, 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 yeah. Well, then in verse 13 it says, Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor decree the decree that thou hast signed, but makest his petition three times a day. Not just once a day, not just twice a day, but he was making his petition three times a day before his God, even though they were telling him he wasn't supposed to. Then the king, in verse 14, when he had heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. Who was he displeased with? He knew at that time that he had been duped because he loved Daniel and he had probably not even thought about it at that point or time and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He wasn't able to do it because of the law of the Medes and the Persians which could not be changed even though it was his own hand that had signed that. Because you see, these individuals were coming against a godly man who they couldn't find any fault in. Oh, to God that we might find somebody in government today who didn't have something against them. Right. Amen? Amen? If that's the only thing they could find for Daniel to be against him is in the law of his God, that's the type of man I want leading the country. Amen. That's the type of man I want leading our community. Amen. That's the type of man that I want leading our families. Amen. Is that we are holy men of God, separated, set apart for the glory of God, that we might once again be a great nation under God. One nation under God. Because you know what? We have gotten so far off track. And I know I've already said that, but we have gotten so far off track to what godliness actually is that it's scary. Amen. When you really see what's going on in the world today, it's absolutely scary to see how far that you know people have no fear of the thought of God in their life. They have no fear. There used to be what was considered a healthy fear of hell. Amen. This church still talks about that. Amen. Amen. There needs to be that healthy fear of hell that none of us would ever want to go there. I wouldn't want to see my worst enemy there. Amen? Because, you know, if we truly love people, Christ commands us that we are to love our enemies. Amen? We're to love them. We're to do everything they can. Now, if they don't like us, that's okay because that's on them. That's not on you. 
But whenever that we see here Daniel, he was faithful to God. There came a point that he had to be thrown into the, into the lion's den because there again, King Darius did not want that to happen. Verse 16, Then the king commanded that they brought Daniel and cast him into the uh, den of the lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thou God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. That's a statement that Darius is making. The God that you are serving continually, Daniel, He's going to deliver you. How many of us have ever came to a point in our life to where we had nowhere else to turn, nobody could pull us out of the pit that we were headed to, but only God. But God. And that was all that you had. Amen. I see hands going up. Because the thing is, that's who we really need to put our trust in. In knowing that the God that we serve continually will be able to save us out of that. Now whenever they put that stone over that lion's den, King Darius, he took his signet and he stamped that, you know, and he put that seal on there to where nobody... I see so many things here almost relating to how that Christ, when He was put into His tomb and that seal that was put on, nobody's taken that stone away until the proper time. But you know what? Darius... I want to tell you, he must have loved Daniel to such a degree that when he didn't even sleep that night, he didn't have the music, he didn't turn the radio on, he didn't do anything. He prayed and he fasted all night long and the Bible says that his sleep left him. So he was up all night long praying for Daniel. He was making supplications for him. He wouldn't be comforted. But yet in the morning, whenever that he went out there and when it was time to take that seal off, And in verse 19, and it says, And when the king arose very early in the morning and went into haste unto the den of the lions, and when he came to the den, he cried with a laminated voice unto Daniel and said, The king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou serve continually able to deliver thee from the lions? So he's hollering down a hole. Now, if you don't know what hollering is, it's kind of like yelling. Okay? Kind of like y'all. Southern, southern talk. Amen. Daniel! Daniel, was your God able to deliver you out of the mouth of a lion? He was questioning if that was he able. And you see, that's where a lot of people are at. Is God going to be able to deliver you out of the circumstances that you were in? But Daniel yells back up at him. He said, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me for as much as before him. Innocence was found in me and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. You see, Daniel didn't do God wrong. Daniel didn't do King Darius wrong. And he was there. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and he commanded that they should take Daniel up and out of the den. So Daniel was taken up and out of the den and no and no manner of hurt was found on him because he believed in his God. Hallelujah. How much are you really believing in your God today? That's a question. That's something that every one of us should ask ourselves. Are we just playing the game? Because you see, I've known people who just played the game. And, and I've had a tip that, Robert, you know what, I've played the game before because that's all that it really was to them. But whenever that you have a seriousness about your relationship with God and His Son, Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, things happen. Amen. Things just drive up. No you know, way. people just show up. Things just happen. What, because of you? No, because of who God is living in you and through you. But you see, what happened after this? Darius kept his word, even according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. God saved Daniel out of the mouth of the lions in there and shut his mouth. That angel showed up and he shut their mouth. But you know, after it was all said and done, Darius said, you bring to me. Now this is kind of paraphrased, but Darius says, you bring to me all of those who caused this to happen. Not only them, but their wives. Not only their wives, but their children as well. And he had them thrown into the lion's den. And the scripture actually says in that portion that even before that they hit the bottom, the lions had them and they broke their bones. 
and they killed them. And then lions had a pretty good feast. Read it for yourself. It's right there. Because God will spare His people and He'll give them provision. But you know, when we have people come against us, it's almost like there are so many stories in the Old Testament to where they wanted to do God's people harm, but yet the very thing that they had for themselves planned in wickedness, God turned it on them and took their lives. Amen. Amen. We need to be sure that we are following in the footsteps of our Lord and our Savior that we be found honest. Are you hearing me? Amen. That we be found worthy. Amen. That we be found faithful. Turn with me to Daniel in chapter 10 as well. Well, I'm having to rush here a little bit, but I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. You pray for me. I may have to paraphrase through a lot of this. Daniel in chapter 10, here we find out another aspect of what had happened to Daniel. It says in verse 1, and it says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, and the thing was revealed unto Daniel, these whose name was Belshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. Now just kind of to get into this, Daniel began to pray. Daniel began to fast. Daniel began to not, not do pleasantries to himself. Probably didn't even take a bath. He was praying and he was seeking God for 21 days. Daniel was seeking God, but at the end of that 21 days, there was an angel that showed up. Now when that angel showed up in Daniel chapter 10, it talks even about the beauty of the angel that was there. That's not the important part of this that I really want to get out here. But when we find out in this area of the Scriptures, how that when Daniel had prayed, it says in verse 12, it says this, Then said he unto, he said unto him, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. On the very first day, the angel was sent because of the sincerity of Daniel's heart. But in verse 13, it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Wow. He prayed for 21 days, but that he was sent on the first day, but yet there was a withstanding there. That's why I have in your notes Ephesians in chapter 6 and verse 12, to where it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness, of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. That means wicked things in heavenly places. I want to tell you, just because you can't see the spirit realm does not mean that it is not there. Paul in the New Testament talks about where there is good, I found out there is also evil present. And there are things that we battle in this life that we cannot see with our natural eye, but yet when we get on our knees and we know that there is a heavenly battle going on, we need to continue in prayer. Amen. We need to continue trusting God because what? That's the power of prayer. Amen. Amen. That's the power of our living God in answering the prayers of His people. I hope this is stirring your soul this morning. I pray that your heart would just be pumping. Some of you are sitting there. I hope your heart's just, man, this is meaning something to me. Because you want to know something? God wants it to mean something to you. He wants you to come to Him and bow down before Him. Not before just an altar at your church, but the altar of your heart. Be open to God and to be able to cry out, God, I've got a need. That's how come I told a lot of people there's times that I pray that I just get real with God. I'm telling God I am struggling in this area of my life and there are times that I've had to say, God, I don't understand, but He makes a way. God will make a way. Amen. I've told some of you this story before. I hadn't planned on telling the story. Will you give me a little grace this morning? Just, just a little bit. Amen. I've got to breathe. That's good. <laughs> 
When I lived in southern Missouri, I was seeking God for something in my life, and I was in my bathroom, kind of like Fred when he was in his. I told Fred the other day when we talked, I said, he said, you might not believe this. I said, oh yeah, I will. God has spoke to me many times in the bathroom. In fact, there's times you want to stay out of there because you're liable to say something to you. But I was in that bathroom and I was praying to God and I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was saying, God, I need an answer. And all of a sudden, I heard this voice and it said, Robert! And I'm like, oh man, somebody's here. Somebody was outside of my door. But I was praying so loud because you know what? You can pray loud. You can pray quietly if you want. But, but you know what? There's often times when your heart is overwhelmed. You need to pray out to God. You need to release those emotions to Him. And whenever that I was praying, one of the gentlemen that I worked with, and Mark Beeson back there can tell you, we remember that man. His name was Scott. I can still tell you today. He was Buddhist. That man was a Buddhist man. But anyhow, whenever I was praying in the bathroom and he... He, I heard him, Robert, he had gotten walked in on the other side of the gate, and I was the gatekeeper at that time. And uh, he came up, and I, I walked out, I think I was probably still on my towel. And he, I said, I'm sorry, I was praying. He said, yeah, I heard you. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you need? Scott? Well, I walked myself in over here. Can, can you get me? Like, yeah, 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 that's fine. I did that. But do you know what, Scott? The Buddhist man that I was telling you about began to go and tell other people that we work with. He began to go tell other people. He said, if you need to get in touch with God, Robert knows how to do it. <laughs> and that's what I'm telling you this morning. You can get in touch with God. Too much of the time we have allowed religion just to simply get in the way. We've allowed routine and rituals to get in our fellowship with God. And, and not that all ritual and routine is wrong. We do some of that here as well. But there comes a point to where you've just got to get down to the nitty gritty because you've got things going on in your life that the only way you're going to get an answer is to get real with God and to let Him speak to your heart. Amen. 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 And that's what Daniel did here. He prayed. And even though he didn't get the answer right on that very moment, he got the answer because of his persistence towards God. And he prayed through to get that answer. In James in chapter 5 and verse 16, there is where the portion of Scripture says this. It talks about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, there's a little more of that scripture, but that's the part I wanted to pull out of that today. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I really wanted to talk about, if you'll turn with me to 1 Kings as well, I wanted to talk about Elijah. I'm going to make this as short as I can. But Elijah, whenever that he was on Mount Carmel, and as if he was on Mount Carmel, he prayed to God, you know, the faults. Um, the false prophets of Baal that were there, they were trying to get their God to answer, but no, their God wouldn't answer. And when it came right down to it, we find out in verse 36 to where that this is the prayer that went forth. And it says, verse 36 of chapter 18 in 1 Kings, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art the God in Israel, that, that thou, I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. You see, he wasn't doing it on his own. He was doing it at the word of the Lord. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the, this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou art, and thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord came and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape, that they take them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kernish. And, and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. Now why did he say that? Because there hadn't been rain for the last three and a half years, but he knew rain was coming. 
Because at His prayer, the rain stopped. At His prayer, the rain began. Prayer is important in our communication with God. As Marilyn comes to the piano and the gym comes and anybody else would like to come up and leave worship, that'd be you, Chris. I'm really trying to get through this today. But in Acts in chapter 12, the last thing and the last story that I would really like to bring out to you today, which I believe is so important, is because even in the New Testament, after that the disciples had seen the resurrected Christ, they were preaching Christ crucified, dead, buried, raised again on the third day, and as that they did, it caused a lot of problems. In fact, in chapter 12 of Acts, it talks about how that Herod had James put to death and how that it pleased the disciples. But yet, or not the disciples, but those that were around, the Jews that were around. And so they took and they put Peter in prison. I'm going to try to summarize this a little quicker. But whenever that they put Peter in prison, they were waiting on Easter to come so they could really make it good. They were going to kill Peter on Easter. But what happens is he was in prison. He was between two guards and he was chained to them. And as he was chained to those guards in the prison, the angel of the Lord came and he came up to Peter. Peter was asleep. You know, he must have been at peace with God because he was asleep and he was sleeping pretty good. And that angel came up and just kind of kicked on Peter. Said, Come on, Peter, get up. And the chains just fell off. They just fell off. Come on, Peter, we got to get out of here. And so he follows that angel. Do you know really the scripture alludes to? He thinks this is a vision. He thinks this is a dream. He doesn't even realize that it is in reality. He thinks it's all in his mind. And he walks out. This angel comes up to a gate. And that gate just opens up on its own accord. And they walk through. And Peter's probably just doing, wow, that was pretty cool. And when they finally get out of the gate, he begins to realize, well, wait a minute. No, I'm out. I'm free. I'm, I'm made free. Why was that? Because in Acts in chapter 12 and verse 5 of that chapter, and it says, And Peter therefore was kept in the prison, but prayers were made without ceasing in the church unto God for him. There were prayers that were being sent up to God on Peter's behalf. And the real cool thing about this is whenever that we find out Peter goes up to this house to where that he knew the disciples were at and he knocks on the door. He knocks on the door and this little damsel comes and her name was Rhoda. She's actually mentioned in the Bible. And she comes to the door and says, Who is it? Is it it's Peter. Let me in. Oh my gosh, Peter's here. Instead of letting him in, what does she do? She runs back to the other disciples and says, Hey, somebody, Peter's out here. Peter's, no, it can't be Peter because he's in prison. See, Peter's in prison. And so they're like, no, 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 he's really out here. So whatever. And so when they finally go out and they let him in, it was Peter. But it all came because of prayer and supplication. I wish I'd have had a little more. Thank you for giving me the grace today to finish this message. Because I hope that you have been inspired today. Because you want to know something? There's too many places to where that we go to church and we don't feel the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We are not here to condemn you. We are here to help you. For there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But we as Christian believers need to be inspired within our faith to make a further stand for the glory of God. Chris and Debbie shared a story with us this morning in Sunday school. And they both said, you know, at one time I may not have been able to have stand up, stood up, and said and did what we did. But they feel like they've been strengthened. They feel like they had the, the spiritual stamina to be able to. That's what I'm trying to bring to you today is that your walk in Christ, you will find more boldness, you will find more freedom in your relationship with God than you ever thought that you had. And you know what? If you just look at me and say, man, that little preacher's nuts. I am so glad to be a fool.
for Christ's sake. Amen. If it is to your benefit. Amen. Amen. As I turn the service over to Brother Chris, and as we sing, just let the Spirit speak to your heart. One more thing, Chris. I'm sorry. I look back there at some little girls, and that there's a little baby back here somewhere. And you know, I really wanted to say something about that, Julie, as well. Look at all the little children that are coming to this church. In a lot of churches, that is lacking, and that's why that the churches aren't sustaining. Because we need the older generation to be in the congregation. But we also need these young families that are going to be here so that this church can go on if God so wills. Thank you, families, for being here and being a part of the Lake Viking Church.
him if he uh, just play some music behind me. And again, it's not going to be any singing. I just think it's kind of nice to have some, some music in the background. Uh, and I had thought about what I was going to say. Then about a week later, one day I woke up and thinking, what did I think I was going to talk about? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually not at a loss for words, but I did. It, it did just whatever it was I was going to talk about. And then a couple of days ago, it just came back. And I thought instead of just getting up here and rambling on, I'd write a few notes so I could read and ramble on. It's, uh, it's, it's fitting for today, this weekend, tomorrow, Veterans Day. What is a veteran? We all know who they are, maybe. Tell by their t-shirts, their ball caps, stories they tell. But do you know what they did? And for those that are still serving, what they do? By one definition, they are a person who served in the active military, naval, or air force, air service, and who was discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than dishonorable. Well, that pretty well sums it up. Not quite. Many picture a veteran as one who was in combat, in the trenches, so to say, or who re routinely was out on patrol, either on foot, on a boat, or ship, or a plane. One who rarely got a good night's sleep, or very little downtime. Yeah, there were many who that applied to, but there were many who, they had support jobs for those that were in the trenches. They were clerks taking care of the paperwork, paperwork that never seemed to stop. Supply. We were always in need of this or that, but it always seemed to be just a day away for us from getting whatever we needed. The cooks. Many of us lived off of MREs, meals ready to eat in a plastic container. Uh, the kind you either ate cold or they had a cooker that went with it. MREs or C rations from day to day or night to night. But when we could get a hot meal, it wasn't mom's home cooking. Running was very welcome. The medics. Some, some were out in the field with the Marines in the Army. The Marines had Navy corpsmen with them. The medics might not have been our most favorite person because of their job and what they did when we had to go for a physical or to get a shot or something like that. But in the time of need, the one you wanted right now. The mail clerk. To get a handwritten letter or a care package, Short of that personal letter from that someone very special, almost anything you got would be shared. Everyone looked forward to those care packages from home. Payroll. Wasn't always a lot to spend your pay on, but you and your family back home depended that that was going to be taken care of. A little side note I did write down on the ship that I was on. The company store was maybe about as far as from the edge of the podium to where the flag is. And maybe about that deep. You get candy, you could get a watch, you could even get a little stereo if you wanted. But they're just letting, letting the whole lot 
to a piece of that time. Intel. The troops, no matter what the mission, always needed to know what they were headed into. You couldn't count on knowing everything out there, but Intel sure minimized <coughs> the odds that I'll favor. Fitness. Aside from your job, you had three things to do. Eat, sleep, or work out. And if you were on 12-hour shifts, that didn't leave a whole lot of time for those other three things. Walking, jogging, softball, playing football, lifting weights, whatever, wherever you were. Somebody had to take care of that equipment so that you could take advantage of whatever it was. They had to maintain the rest of us so we could enjoy it. Now, one of my duties as a first sergeant when I was in the Air Guard and deployed was to take care of Red Cross messages that needed to be passed to the troop. It could be about a sickness. Maybe that's all it was. It was just a serious sickness, illness of somebody back home. Many times it was about a death in the family. And as a first sergeant, I could rehearse all I wanted to on the way to go see them. But when I finally met up with the individual, there was no rehearsal. You just, and they knew what the first sergeant was there for. In, in one particular case, the message was along this line. A soldier, the airman, his wife had gone in for the five month prenatal wellness check. There was no heartbeat. So that makes it, uh, you can't sugarcoat those messages. You just have to, you have to think about what you're going to say, how you're going to say it. And only one of those messages that I ever had to deliver, the family had told the Red Cross, do not get the chaplain involved. And so I don't know what the history was of, of their family, but that, it fell off my shoulder. But the last one I'm going to be reference to was a chaplain. <coughs> He's the only, or she, was the only one in any branch of the military who could not and would not bear arms. If they did, they would, they would lose their status as the, as the clergy, and they wouldn't have that protection. Wouldn't bear arms no matter what. But in that soldier or sailor, marine, airman, in that time of need, the chaplain <coughs> very well could be the strongest one to ever put on him. 